We'll start out tonight really um, talking a little bit about cancer and what it looks like in dogs today. So cancer is the leading cause of disease-related death in dogs and, and cats every year. It makes up somewhere around 45 to 47 percent of why dogs die every year, and it makes up about 32 percent of why cats die every year. So it's, it, it's a very big thing, actually, when you start to sit down and look at it. There are about 75 million dogs in the United States at all times and somewhere between 80 and 90 million cats. So to give you an idea of how many cancer cases we'll see, it's estimated that we'll see somewhere around 4 to 5 million dogs and 4 to 5 million cats in the next year um, and basically each year develop cancer. So that could be up to 10 million dogs and cats that will develop cancer in this next year. So that's a lot. Um, that should keep us all pretty busy. Uh, the Morse Animal Foundation does a lot of surveys and I always like looking at their surveys because it always tells me something that um, either I didn't know or that I thought was happening and then they just confirmed it. They did a, a survey a few years back and, and they polled a bunch of pet owners and asked them, what do you feel is the biggest health concern for your dog or your cat? And the number one answer was cancer. Number one answer for all pet owners really, or 47 percent of the pet owners that is, was cancer. The closest thing to that was heart disease, but it only made up about 7%. So you can see how important individuals, pet owners, think cancer is. And you can also see how important it truly is. Um, realistically, I always joke because it's 47% will develop disease, and at least 47% people, 47 people thought it was an issue. So they're kind of right on the money there. It, they did another survey that looked at doctor and client communication, and they asked these guys, it gave them a list, basically it was like a checklist, and it said, you know, which of these topics do you feel is something important you should be sitting down and talking to your, you know, your, your family veterinarian about? Well, 90% check nutrition, 85% check cancer, and 75% check health supplements. So you kind of get an idea that, yes, cancer, again, made right at the top of, of things they thought that they should be talking about with you guys. What was even interesting, more interesting to me, was the fact that they asked them, of these topics, which ones would you feel comfortable bringing up yourself, initiating that conversation? Only about 20% felt like that they would feel comfortable bringing up cancer or bringing up nutrition, and only 10% felt like they were comfortable bringing up health supplements. So that was always interesting to me because it's, they know it's important, your clients know it's important, it is important from the statistics that we've seen already tonight, yet it may be a conversation that you guys have to initiate in the future to talk about. So. Cancer is going to continue to be a big problem, if not the biggest problem or concern we face in pets in the future. And there's several reasons for that. Well, one is, is that we're actually doing a better job, and you guys are doing a better job with taking care of animals. We're seeing them just simply live longer. You know, years ago, 10-year-old dog was a pretty old dog. Now it's pretty common to see a 14 or 15-year-old dog walk through your clinic. So these guys are living longer, and because they're living longer, they're actually having the opportunity to develop some of these chronic diseases like heart disease, kidney disease, cancer. And obviously, as they live longer, you're going to see more of this. You're also going to diagnose more of this, and the reason you're going to diagnose more of this is because our diagnostics and our ability to diagnose these diseases are getting better. Growing up on a farm, I had a lot of dogs that died of old age, um, they, they, unknown causes. Now we know it was histiocytic sarcoma, or it was metastatic hemangial sarcoma to the brain, things that you know, we would not have diagnosed years ago. You're also seeing a big increase in the human-animal bond, and that's happening every year, and we, we talk about it all the time. Owners not only are going to see more of this in the future in their pets, we're not only going to diagnose more of this, but they're going to want to treat more of these diseases too because these are truly members of their family. Because of all this information I just kind of threw, it at, you, threw out at you, it tells you really, and the reason I said all that stuff was how important learning about cancer is. How important is it for us to talk about it? How important is it for you guys to get information to be able to explain this stuff to your clients? The first place to start is, and the first question I get a lot of times is, how did my dog get cancer? I didn't even know they got cancer. How did, how did, why did this happen? How did this happen? So it's the same in a dog as it is in a person, and it's usually something we should talk about. So how easy is it for a dog to develop cancer? We know it's common, but how easy is it for it to happen? The best place to start is with a couple guys, Hanahan and Weinberg. And Hanahan and Weinberg were a couple uh, human oncology researchers. And 
And 2000 was just a few years ago, so this stuff has been around for a long time. But they actually sat down and said, you know, no one's ever actually described what the hallmarks of cancer are. No one's actually said, what does it take for a normal cell to go to a tumor? How does that happen? What, are, what, does it need, what needs to happen? So they made this chart with six basic hallmarks of cancer. So what I always talk to clients about is you're born with normal cells for the most part and you have a fairly set number of those cells. A certain number of blood cells, a certain number of skin cells, a certain number of bone cells. And as you're going through life, some of those cells will wear out, some of them will die off. And the body senses that and when it senses that you've lost a couple cells, it'll send a signal out to say you've lost some cells, now make some cells to take their place. So those signals go out, the cells start to make a couple new cells, make enough just to replace what you were lost and then they shut it down. The idea is it's very tightly regulated. You only make what you need to replace what you've lost. So what happens in cancer is some wear and tear, some mutation happens to one of your cells that allows it to turn itself on, allows it to start causing itself to replicate without the body to tell it to do so. So when that happens, you get too many cells being produced. As more cells produced, they start to accumulate in an area and you get a lump or a bump or a tumor. So that's really what happens. A lot of people will ask, well, why, you know, what, it, what it happened to cause that mutation? Well, in dogs it's interesting because in people we always try to put some cause and effect relationship to it. You smoked, so your lung cells got damaged, they converted, and they started reproducing out of control. You laid out in the sun too much, so your skin cells got damaged, and they started reproducing out of control. Dogs eat fairly well-balanced diet, consistent diet. They exercise every day. They sleep a lot. They don't work at tough places to work. They don't work around hazardous products. They, they work, they're, they're the person we want to be. I mean, they eat, eat the right food, they exercise, they don't work too much, they don't stress, they sleep plenty, yet they get more cancer than we ever thought about getting. A lot of it is, is because their body's exposed to a lot more wear and tear. Their body, unfortunately, ages at a much more rapid rate than ours does. And because that, that body's aging like that, little, little mutations, little damage, little wear and tear to those cells that happens every day doesn't get repaired like ours would and gets passed on to the next generation. So very quickly in a dog, some of these mutations can start to build up until the cells start converting and doing things they're not supposed to do, like becoming tumors. So the hallmarks for cancer really start with that gaining that self-sufficiency and growth signals. They're able now to turn themselves on and start reproducing without the body telling them to do so. The second thing that has to happen is this insensitivity to anti-growth signals. So the body usually tells it to start growing, but then when you make enough cells, it shuts it down. These cancer cells have to be able to turn themselves on and be insensitive to the body trying to shut it down. They also have to have this limitless replicative ability or potential it needs to just keep doing it. It doesn't have to be high grade and be doing it real fast. It just has to be able to continuously keep reproducing cells. So there's no end point. As more cells are produced and more start to pile up and the bigger the tumor gets, it has to do this right here. It has to start making blood supply to support those cells. If it's not making a blood supply to support those cells, then you go back here and you, you'll limit yourself. So it has to make a blood supply. The fifth thing that happens is as those cells accumulate, they need to hang out, they need to survive, so they need to avoid apoptosis. And finally, as they're all accumulating in the area and they're all hanging out, they've got to find a place to go, find some room to set up shop. And so they've got to find a place to either to be invade the surrounding tissues and or metastasize. If those six things happen, a normal cell can become cancer. Now, the hallmarks of cancer are not just the basics of what it takes for a cell to become a tumor. They're also the very common hallmarks or principles we use to learn how to combat cancer, to design therapies to fight this stuff. However, if little mutations or alterations to those areas we just talked about, those hallmarks happen, then our therapies will just simply be rendered ineffective. And what I do with medical oncology, this is going to result in drug resistance. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, drug resistance. And, and resistance really just starts out with a definition. It's basically just the reduction in effectiveness of a drug. And that can be an antibiotic or it can be a chemotherapy agent, antineoplastic agent. It's the ability, in this case of a cell, to withstand the effects of a drug that would normally be lethal to those species, that tissue, those cells, 
Drug resistance stems from the idea that these drugs we create for cancer therapy are specific targets, they, or they target specific proteins or specific targets to cause their effects. So little minor changes, little mutation in those targets, little mutations in those proteins virtually render those drugs ineffective altogether. But why is it so important? Why is it so important to cancer? Well, the first thing is, is because those mutations, those changes, that drug resistance can be there in tumors prior to ever receiving chemotherapy, ever receiving a drop of chemotherapy. It can be, or it can be acquired as you're going through treatment. So the idea is, is that you're probably going to see it. You're going to have to learn about it because you're going to deal with it at some point treating cancer. It's also going to affect significantly the selection of the single drugs you use. You need to know what drugs you're using and what their mechanisms of resistance could be. And they're definitely going to affect the drug combinations used in patients undergoing chemotherapy. You don't want to put five drugs together in a protocol that all have the exact same mechanisms of resistance. Because if the tumor makes that mechanism resistance, then all the drugs are rendered ineffective. Finally, the cross-resistance, kind of what we were just talking about. So cross-resistance is something that certainly occurs, and that's when a mechanism of resistance to one drug can render a lot of drugs on your shelf ineffective. You have to know which drugs go with which mechanisms of resistance so you know if this is happening, these guys over here probably aren't going to work. I need to choose something way different from the one I'm using. But honestly, none of that stuff matters as much as the last one. And it's the fact that it's not one of the top contributors, honestly I should have changed that, it's the top contributor to why we lose patients every day to, can to, to cancer. Our unsuccessful therapies most of the time is related to drug resistance. So starting out talking about, starting out learning about drug resistance, you think, I was sitting there writing this lecture and I thought, where do I start with this? Well, the perfect place to start is 1984. So. In 1984, 85, early mid-80s, mid cancer was scary. I mean, and it still is today, but it was even more scary back then. This was something at the time people were getting diagnosed with. They were undergoing treatment. They would stop responding to treatment. Their tumor would progress, and they'd lose their life. And this happened all the time. We didn't have as many people surviving as we do today. So there's a couple of guys, Goldie and Coldman, that would see these patients. Man, they were doing well. They stopped responding, and, and they'd lose them. And they said, man, there's some kind of resistance thing going on. We've got to figure this out. So they started putting all their efforts into looking into drug resistance. The first thing that they determined was tumor size was proportional to the probability of having at least one or more drug resistant cells. And this is something that people always thought was happening, but these guys proved it. The bigger your tumor was, the greater the chance was that this tumor had drug resistant cells in it. So they thought, okay, we've proved that. When does it start happening? When does that resistance start coming into to effect? So they took some of these cancer cells from various tumors and put them in the lab and let them start growing. And every doubling, and every stage along the way, they exposed it to chemo. Okay, we got them all. Okay, we got them all. Okay, we got them all. Oh, wait a minute, that guy survived. And they would repeat that over and over until they figured out that resistance showed up within about six doublings. It would go from no resistance to within about six replication cycles the cancer cells would have at least one cell that had developed resistance to the drug they were using. So it only took about six doublings. So that was really important because they thought, okay, cool, all we got to do is catch these tumors before six doublings and we can take care of the problem. So then they looked at this curve, and this is called a Gompertsian growth curve. And Gompertsian growth curve is pretty cool. It's basically just what a tumor does. This is the start of the tumor, goes up, and this is where the end of the, end of the line comes into play. So it's, it's how a tumor grows. As you can see when it starts out, this curve is pretty flat and then it just goes north, takes a turn and heads up. The reason that happens is, is, is be the way our cells divide, the way our cells reproduce. If you have a normal cell in your body, well, the way it reproduces most of the time is it makes a clone of itself. So if you have some little bit of mutation, some little bit of wear and tear, that cell, when it goes to divide, just clones itself and passes it on to the next generation. So if you have a mutation for cancer, as those cells divide, they pass that mutation on, so it goes from 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 16. So you get this exponential growth and a quickly turn from a flat line to a very perpendicular uh, large curve upward. 
Now, the more important thing that this thing showed us was this right here. We normally diagnose a tumor after 30 doublings. The weight or the size of the tumor or the amount of tumor that has to be present for us to diagnose it is about one gram. So the other night when I was doing this talk, Heather said, you ought to show them like, what one gram looks like. So we like got a little scale out in the kitchen. We weighed some stuff trying to figure out what one gram was going to look like. It was a lot smaller than I'd even thought it would be. It turned out to be like a little clove of garlic. It was actually about one gram. You could, you could kind of weigh that. So not very big, but it takes that amount for us to typically diagnose a tumor. And that's about 30 doublings. Now, Goldie and Coleman showed that we need to, have, we need to catch it before six doublings. So that was a lot different. Unfortunately, it takes 30 doublings for us to diagnose it, but it only takes another 10 doublings before it becomes lethal to the patient. So when you look at this, what you take away from it is, is that we're working in a very narrow window of time with these tumors, and, all, and, and typically all cancer honestly follows this curve. But we work in a, a very narrow window with a very upward flowing, steep growth curve, highly replicating process. And we're working in a, in a time period where we have proven that there absolutely will be resistant cells. Goldie and Coleman basically hypothesized that at these very low numbers, even at very, very low numbers, resistant cells will not respond to your treatment. They'll rapidly emerge over time as a dominant population. And even if you're treating these guys, they'll come about and eventually take over and emerge as what will end up being lethal to the cancer patient. They predicted, though, if you could find a microscopic foci of cancer at that pre-six doubling point, you could cure it. However, if the tumors grew, resistance increased and cure became very difficult. So. Basically, you're, you're looking at something there in 1984 that these guys said, this is how you cure cancer. Just catch it early. And that's where all that came about. That's what people started saying, early diagnosis. Unfortunately, that was 84. This is 2012, and I'm giving a lecture on drug resistance. So it's hard. It's hard to diagnose it early. We're getting better every day. We're learning techniques and diagnostics abilities that we never even thought we could do. We're having imaging modalities we never even thought we was possible, so we're getting closer. And I think we will get there one day, but right now we're not, so we really have to learn as much as we can about this drug resistance because it is something that we're going to be battling on a day-to-day -day basis when we treat cancer. So drug resistance is, what hap is, is basically what allows a small, non-clinical, fairly insignificant lump or bump turn into a large, debilitating, burden of disease, life-threatening mass, even in the face of our treatments. Now, whenever you're starting out to talk about drug resistance, or you're, you, you go into talking about it, I threw a couple things here in the first in, and I felt like it was something we should go over. It's just to tell you where we've been. So, ultimately, we will talk about, at the cell level, the mechanisms that cells become resistant. But first, we're going to talk a little bit just about and I'm just going to give you the, the models that have been presented. Now, these are, some of these are very old, but it's the ideas where people looked at tumors, and they didn't think about the cell level. They thought about it at the tumor level. What does it take? Why did that tumor become resistant? You know, what's happening in that tumor to make it resistant? And they called it a model of drug resistance. And there's about four of those that have been proposed over the years. The next is some classifications. These classifications really are, whoop, these classifications really are just... Um, a few definitions, a few terms that as we talk about uh, the different mechanisms of resistance, it'll, it'll help you better understand where they're coming from. Terms like acquired resistance or intrinsic resistance or genetic resistance. So the first is talking about these models of drug resistance. The first thing was proposed that when they saw a tumor become resistant, they said it's probably due to mutations, just random, random acts of mutations. You know, if, if mutations cause cancer, then mutations probably cause resistance. The tumor's just growing. Over time, it picks up a mutation in one of the cells that's in the tumor that makes that cell be able to survive the drugs we're using. And that's just referred to typically as a conventional model. Been out there for years and years and years and years. The next was stem cells. When we discovered stem cells years ago, they kind of tagged it on all kinds of stuff, and, and cancer was one of those too. They said a stem cell is a proprietary cell, a precursor cell, and he kind of is watching what's happening in an area in tissue, and if there's a new need, when he repopulates that cell, 
um, he's going to give it the ability to survive. So basically this stem cell is going to repopulate these tumors as cells are dying off, but give them mechanisms to help them survive. The next one is intrinsic resistance. So this whole concept was just that your, a tumor is just a diverse group of cells. They may all be lymphocytes, they may all be osteo, um, osteosarcoma cells, they may all be hemangiosarcoma cells, but some of them are going to be really susceptible to drug, some of them are going to be kind of susceptible to drug, and some of them are going to be really resistant to drug. The ones that are resistant will keep surviving, the ones that are susceptible will die off. So that they're always there. It's not a mutation, it's not a stem cell, they're just always there. And then the fourth one was that, yeah, you can have resistant cells that are there, but it's really the cells that have that high replication population because those are the ones that are continuing to repopulate tumors. Those are the ones that are, that are reproducing really fast and making up the bulk of the tumor. So all of those models were proposed, and, and honestly, it's not one particular model. It's a combination of all of those models that really make a tumor be resistant. But it's kind of cool to hear kind of as you go through time the way we looked at different stuff. You need to know a little bit about classifications, and so there's four big classifications we'll talk about. We'll talk about intrinsic or acquired resistance, and we'll talk about genetic or epigenetic resistance. And again, there's a lot of overlap between these categories. So intrinsic drug resistance is really just mechanisms of resistance that you inherit, um, that are essential or inherent properties of a cell. They're there from birth. Acquired drug resistance is mechanisms of resistance that you de develop after you're born. They're post-fetally developed mechanisms. Now they can develop during treatment or they can develop prior to any drug exposure. You can even develop resistance before you get cancer. You may have a cell on your skin gets exposed to some things, gets a mutation, it makes it more resistant. So if cancer develops in that area, it will be inherently more resistant. Some of your required resistance mechanisms can be permanent and some can be transient. And we'll talk more about that because it's pretty interesting. I'll give you a little spoiler of an example of that. Transient resistant would be blood supply. You have a tumor, it's growing fast. I give them a dose of doxorubicin and I get some shrinkage of the tumor. I wait a little while, I give them another dose and the whole tumor shrinks down real small. Well, maybe because when I gave that first dose there wasn't enough blood supply going to the center or diffused to the other cells within that tumor, so those cells just weren't getting exposed to the drug. Now that blood supply is there, that mechanism of resistance is gone. It's, it was transient. So that would be a mechanism and it's a transient mechanism. And we'll talk about some more in, in just a little bit. And then there's genetic or epigenetic. And these mechanisms can work together to, again, make a tumor resistant. Genetic drug resistance is a change to the molecular structure of a gene. It's basically a change to the DNA of that gene or that cell. And it's going to alter how that, how that gene is expressed. These changes can be intrinsic. You're born with a mutation in your DNA. Or it can be acquired. You have a mutation that happens after life that, that damage, or after birth that, that damages um, the DNA of your cell. And then there's epigenetic drug resistance. So this may be one that some of you have heard about. This may be one that some of you have not heard about. Um, epigenetics is an interesting topic. It's one I'm bringing up tonight because of the simple fact that it's, it's something we're studying a lot, something we're, we're learning a lot about, and we're actually developing some drugs and things right now that, are, that may change a lot of how we look at cancer and treat cancer. Epigenetics is a study of changes in gene expression in mechanisms other than actually affecting the DNA. So when, it, when DNA is transcribed, when a cell replicates, the DNA is, is obviously important as it's replicating, but there's a lot of support staff that goes along with that DNA. There's a lot of proteins that help it be tra transcribed. You can affect those proteins, cause damage to those proteins, and thus affect how um, that DNA is expressed without actually causing any change to the DNA. That's epigenetics. You're changing the genetics, but you're not actually changing the DNA. You're just changing some of the proteins that help it be expressed. So this is a really, really highly studied area in oncology right now, and we'll talk a lot about it. The two big types of epigenetics that we'll talk about later is DNA methylation and histone deacetylation. So again, I know that was kind of just some rapid run through, some background stuff there, but however you classify a mechanism of resistance, whatever model you tag to the tumor, it is the reason why that little tumor becomes that big guy and ultimately can cause a downfall to that dog with cancer.
So these are going to be the true mechanisms of how we develop drug resistance. This is at the level of the cell. What happens to that cancer cell that makes it resistant? This is interesting. This is actually an electron microscopic image of a breast, uh, breast cancer cell dividing. I just saw that. I thought that was pretty, pretty cool. Oncologist thinks that certain things are cool that other people think are cool. Um, so here's a bunch of different ways that, that are, are mechanisms of resistance. As, as you can see, resistance can start at the very point when you inject a drug into the bloodstream. It's got to get into the cell. Maybe it's not getting into the cell. And we'll go through a bunch of these. It can affect target proteins that the drug binds to. Um, it can affect, after it causes DNA, mechanisms of resistance can be that you start to get in, increased repair of that DNA. It can affect the apoptosis process, or it can be one of these epigenetic or transient influences. Now we're going to talk about several of these. We're going to talk about the re reduced drug uptake, increased drug efflux. We're going to talk about those target proteins and how they can be altered, what the drug actually binds to. Um, we're going to talk about some mechanisms of detoxification our body normally has that inactivate drugs and chemicals and foreign products when they enter your body. The increased cellular and DNA repair. After the damage is caused, your body can upregulate mechanisms to repair that damage. Um, decreased apoptosis. You damage the DNA, but the cells aren't dying like they're supposed to. And then finally, these new classes of mechanisms resist epigenetics and transient influences. So the first one's going to be drug uptake. Obviously you inject the drug into the body, but it has to get into the cancer cell to cause its, you know, cause its effects. So drugs can enter cells by a passive process, an active process, or a facilitated transport process. The effectiveness of your drug really just depends on can the drug get to the cell and get in the cell. It's that simple. So the simplest thing in the world is you got to have a blood supply. If I'm injecting uh, drugs into your body, but you don't have a blood supply to all parts of the cell and some of those, or all parts of the tumor, some of those cancer cells are not getting exposed to drug. Tumor cells have to be reproducing. They have to be dividing. They have to be active. If the tumor's just sitting there, not growing, not doing anything, unfortunately, it's probably not going to respond to the drugs you're giving it. Those cells cannot be in a latent phase, I guess, of the cell cycle. So. This is my fancy drawing on uptake. Um, simple, but perfect. Uh, if, you, if you look at drug uptake resistance, it's again, decreased blood supply, non-proliferating cell, latent phase of the cell cycle. But these are the, these are the more important thing. These are the drugs that are going to be affected by uptake. So your platinum agent, cisplatin, carboplatin, both of these are, these are pretty heavy drugs. They have to be transported into the cell. They need a little help to get into the cell. If you have some changes in their, in their mechanisms of transport, those drugs, you'll inject them in the body and you'll just urinate them out. And actually, we see that a lot of times. We can actually test and when we're injecting drug to see how much you're actually losing. So some of that will increase. And they notice that in people a lot of times. They notice that they'll start losing more drug over time um, and they're thinking that it's reduced uptakes happening. Methotrexate, we don't use a lot of methotrexate. When, when I was in my residency the first year or two, we, we used quite a bit of methotrexate. It was, it was pretty common for a few years treating lymphoma patients. It still has some, some definitely some... Uh, key characteristics to use it, but the problem with methotrexate was it's, it's actually susceptible to about, to about every mechanism resistant that I put on that list a while ago. So unfortunately patients become resistant to it fairly quickly. And one of those mechanisms is going to be a reduced uptake. Methotrexate has to bind to what's called a folate carrier and be carried into the cell, otherwise it doesn't do anything. And then there's anti-metabolites, gemcitabine or gemzar, 5-fluorouracil or 5-FU, and then um, Cytarabine, cytosine or ribonocide or cytosol, those, those three really need also to be helped into the cell. So you have to be able to get into the cell. Usually it's vascular supply and the cell is just reproducing. And then there's some that actually have to have special carriers to take them in. But once you get in the cell, probably the one that we need to spend the most time on is it just going right out the other side of the cell. So increased drug efflux. This is probably the most studied and, and, and well-known mechanism of drug resistance. The reason it's so important and the reason it is so common is because a cell in your body um, was created, honestly, to be self-sustainable. 
It was supposed to take care of itself. It had no recollection when it was made that there was going to be a doctor that came by every now and then and gave it drugs. So it thinks when it sees chemicals or toxins or something that's not supposed to be in its internal aspect of the cell, it's get it out of there. We we're supposed to remove that. That was what we were told to do when we were made. So a lot of cells have mechanisms for detoxification and one are pumps that pump foreign substances out of the cell. And the primary player in this is P-glycoprotein pump. So the P-glycoprotein pump has been tagged the mother of drug resistance. And this is basically a plasma membrane drug efflux pump. It's on the kind of the membrane of the cell and it's going to actively pump cells or pump drugs out of the cell when it's exposed to it. Now the reason this is such a big deal and the reason it's called the mother of drug resistance is because it's an ATP binding cassette transporter or ABC transporter pump. That means it uses energy to move stuff. So because it uses energy to move stuff, it can move anything. It can move big products, little products, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, any substrate really that's fairly structurally similar can grab it and get it out of there because of that energy driven aspect of the pump. So normally p glycoprotein pumps are supposed to be there and they aid in the survival of your cells, but when those cells become cancerous, they're also going to aid in the survival of cancer cells. p glycoprotein drug resistance can be an intrinsic thing. You can be born with having those pumps. You should have some pumps. Um, or it can be acquired. You're exposed to a drug and the body recognizes and it started increasing those number of pumps to help with, with getting rid of that drug. But it's not an equal distribution. And this is really cool and really interesting to kind of think about. You have certain tissues in your body that just have more of these pumps. I mean, they simply do. They're exposed to more stuff and they need more pumps to, to help keep them healthy. The small intestine, the colon, the lung, the brain, these are areas that have more pumps. So intrinsically, you have more pumps. So if cancer develops in those areas, Unfortunately, they already have an inherent mechanism of resistance in place that can help them survive chemotherapy. One thing to think about on these pumps, kind of gets you really kind of stepping back and looking at stuff, is can that explain why single types of cancers respond differently based on location? So think about lymphoma in a dog. Same dog, same cell, same diagnosis, lymphoma. I can put it in every single lymph node in that dog's body. I can have it going all throughout his spleen, all throughout his liver, bring him in here, give him vincristine, cytoxin, doxorubicin, some prednisone. He's got about a 90% chance plus to go to respond to those drugs. He'll probably be in remission in the first couple of weeks, feeling great, doing great. And he's going to go on after I start treating him and live for another year, year and a half on average. If I take that same lymphoma, same cell, same dog, no lymph nodes, no liver, no spleen, everything looks great, and put a mass in his small intestine. That dog could come in here, have more like a 50% chance of responding, and maybe succumb to his disease in three or four months. So what's that tell you? Well, it means that, that, that same cancer was way more aggressive, way more resistant to the drugs in the location of that small intestine than he was in all those lymph nodes and all that liver and all that spleen. So stuff like p glycoprotein pumps and intrinsically knowing where they are and what they're located on can really change what drugs you choose. Because if you're choosing vincristine and doxorubicin and prednisone for some of these locations where we know this is already an inherent mechanism of resistance, you may not have the same response that you would have if you chose a drug that was not a substrate of those pumps. So knowing where they are, knowing what the mechanisms of resistance those drugs have, it's going to help you define a much more effective chemotherapy protocol. So acquired mutations are simple. They can amplify the number of the pumps you have on the cells when they recognize there's something there that shouldn't be there. Making that cancer cell um, more resistant, increasing drug removal, decreasing the effects of the chemo. Interestingly enough, and this is rare, I will say this is rare, but I have seen this happen and we always think, hypothesize that this is what happened here. Mutations can also occur that reduce the number of p-glycoprotein pumps on some of your healthy cells. Therefore, when you give the same amount of drug that you had previously been given, you see increased toxicity to that drug. And it starts limiting whether you can use that drug at all or certainly limiting the dose that you can use in that drug. And when I've seen this happen, and, and it's, not, it's very difficult to prove this, there's not a lot you can do to counter this when you see it, you just got to know it's a possibility, is 
I have a dog. I'm giving him vincristine. We're getting out several, you know, several cycles. He's been doing great. Responds wonderful to the drug. Never has an effect. And all of a sudden, this dog starts having toxicity related to the drug. The elders start telling me, I don't know. Last time he got that drug, he just got sick. And I'm thinking, oh, it's probably a fluke. We'll give him something and just keep an eye on him. And you do it again, and you're like, wow, he really is becoming sensitive to this drug. What could be happening in those dogs is that there are mutations that are happening in his normal cells that are just making them more sensitive to the drugs that we're using. So that may be a reason we have to switch. And I definitely have. I definitely had lymphoma dogs that I've had to switch giving them vincristine and add in a different drug. So obviously we've talked a lot about it there. But why is it such a big deal? I mean, you had this whole list of all these different mechanisms. I'm just talking about these, these little efflux pumps. The reason it's a big deal, again, goes back to this energy-driven transport. Peak glycoprotein and drug efflux resistance is a significant cause of multi-drug resistance. Again, it can move really anything that's fairly structurally similar. It doesn't have to be the same drug. So we may be using one drug and end up making this dog resistant to various drugs. So multiple drug resistance, the idea is just that. It's exposed, you expose cancer cells to a single drug, but they develop resistance to a broad range of functionally unrelated drugs. So I'm giving a guy prednisone. He's on prednisone for two or three weeks. Dog looks great. He comes out of remission. Uh, you better get him down to see Dr. Van so we'll start treating him with vincristine at that point. Unfortunately, and this is, goes back to why you, you, know, you hear those things and, and, you, and then when you start going through and studying, you're like, okay, that's why they told me not to give that guy prednisone when he comes down there. Because he may start developing more of these pigalacoprotein pumps and instead he starts becoming resistant to this and this and this and the toposide and mitoxantrum and paclitaxel and all this stuff. So that one mechanism resistance, even if they've never seen those drugs, they can now already be resistant to a whole bunch of the chemotherapies that you'd like to use to treat that dog with a, that cancer. So how do we fight it? I mean, we know it's a big deal. I've, I've talked about it a lot. So how do we start to fight MDR, multiple drug resistance, and these P-glycoprotein pumps? Well, you've got to make it hard on the cell to pump that drug out. You want to make sure you're giving them appropriate dose, increasing their doses, so we make sure that those pumps, if they're there, they have to work hard to get all the drug out of the cell. Now, saying that, I'm probably going to be the one person in this room, or at least one of the top people in this room, to tell you that it's not as simple as just increasing the dose because quality of life for these guys is so important. For me, when I go in and talk to an owner, the first thing I say is, you know, by far and away, my first job is to give your dog the best quality of life possible. I want him to be normal. I don't want him to be in the hospital. I want him to run and play and enjoy life. Quality of life is primary goal number one. Quantity is going to be a byproduct of quality. I want to make him live longer, but not at the expense of his quality. So when we talk about increasing the dose of drug, we're talking about using the appropriate dose, not overdosing, not underdosing, but making sure we're doing everything we can, but also giving him the best quality of life possible. In the human field right now, there's something really cool happening to kind of battle pig like a protein pumps, and that is trying to level the playing field, protect your normal cells. We know that cancer cells have, are developing these multiple, this multi-drug resistance, these increased numbers of P-glycoprotein pump. But with the Human Genome Project and with the, the Canine Genome Project, they were able to map out what genes were responsible for the expression of these pumps. And so they know the MDR1 gene and this ABC1, uh, Delta1 gene that are responsible to make these P-glycoprotein pumps. And they're looking now to transfect those, those genes actually onto some bone marrow cells or some GI tract cells that are going to eventually make those normal tissues, those parts of the body, somewhat resistant or at least somewhat increasingly protected from the chemo we're using. It's pretty crazy, but their idea is that they're trying to harness the power of that p glycoprotein pump and add it to the normal cells so when that drug goes in the body, it gets pumped, the, the chemo gets pumped out of those normal cells and they can increase the amount going into the, to the, chemo, uh, the cancer cells. The other way to, to kind of fight this is to know which tumors have it. And obviously, you, to select the right drug, you at least have to have the idea of whether that drug has this mutation or has this um, sensitivity or not. So on the human side right now, we're looking at a couple different things to, to identify MDR or, or p glycoprotein cells. Um, 
we're looking at something called rhodinamine-123. Rhodinamine-123 is, is just a stain that's added to tissue or tumor tissue and it's able to highlight which cells are, are going to express p glycoprotein pumps. And then there's this technesium 99 m systema B. And 99 m systema B is basically a radiopharmaceutical, just like technesium 99 or iodine you give to a cat with a thyroid issue. And, and it'll highlight, not thyroid tissue, but it'll highlight cancer tissue that's expressing p glycoprotein pumps. Again, telling you which tumors are expressing it so you can make better drug selection. Something we're doing right now. Um, on the veterinary side, there's active studies and clinical trials going on, is we're actually looking at these pumps and we're saying, you know, these pumps move a lot of stuff. Is there something non-toxic that I can give this guy prior to his chemo to keep these p glycoproteins pump busy, to bind them up so when I then come in with his chemotherapy, it's bound up with doxycycline instead of doxorubicin. So more doxorubicin stays in the cell and causes effects because it's, it's competitively inhibited with this other drug. That's happening right now. That's something we can do right now, something we're, we are doing right now with certain, certain chemo protocols. And there's going to be some studies come out in the next couple of years telling us whether that works or not and how much benefit it actually has given us. In dogs, I, told, I talked about a couple different ways to image p glycoprotein pumps in um, humans. This is one way to image it in a dog. You can actually use a monoclonal antibody called C219. And C219 is just, a, is just an immunohistochemistry stain that highlights p glycoprotein pump. So a study was done a few years back looking at dogs with lymphoma. So they took 58 dogs with lymphoma and they stained their tissue at the time of diagnosis, at the time of their relapse, and eventually at the time of their necropsy for p glycoprotein with this C219 monoclonal antibody. Now what they discovered was kind of what we thought we would discover. And that is that at diagnosis, at relapse, and at necropsy, the number of p glycoprotein pumps you had, the expression went straight up. So as these dogs progressed through their disease, even though they were responding to treatment, the number of pumps they had increased. The other thing that they found was it was the most prognostic indicator of everything they looked at. I'm talking if it was in the bone marrow, if it was in the spleen, wherever it was. So the most prognostic indicator was whether you had a lot of p glycoprotein pump expression or a little p glycoprotein pump expression. This will be something that probably will become commercial. It actually isn't that commercially available right now or we do a lot more of it. Um, not every lab can do it. But it is something that's out there and I think it is something as we start to see that, okay, we've got drugs that are now available to us that may make a difference, um, then we may start doing more of this staining uh, to determine if you have these pumps or not. One thing I do want to mention, and this is just kind of as a total side note because I, I think it's interesting, is there are other proteins other than p glycoprotein pump uh, that convey resistance to multiple drugs. These are three of them on the human side that we see multi-drug resistance associated, lung resistant and breast cancer resistant proteins. And basically what it is is if you have one of these proteins and you, on certain tumors, um, you're going to have a, a more resistant tumor and a poor prognosis. And so. If you look at MRP, multidrug resistant protein, um, you, acute leukemia, transitional cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, in people it, it's very prognostic. If you have this, it's going to reduce your, um, your response rate. Lung resistant protein, same thing. Acute leukemia, ovarian cancer, multiple myeloma, uh, fibrosarcoma, all of these tumors, we've, we've noticed uh, this protein on them. If you have that protein expressed, you're not going to have as good a prognosis as if you didn't. Now, there's not a lot of canine and feline studies looking at these proteins, um, but myself and, and certainly other individuals think that proteins, either these proteins or proteins similar to these, can answer some of the questions why we have certain tumors in certain pets uh, that just don't respond, it seems, to almost anything. So you take squamous cell carcinoma in people, if you have MRP expressed, you're very resistant to chemotherapy. If you take squamous cell carcinoma in a cat, a lot of times it just doesn't respond to much. I mean, you give it chemotherapy, we've seen transitional cell carcinomas melt away. We've seen squamous cell carcinomas in other locations melt away. You put it in a cat, and it seems like it doesn't respond very well in an oral squame. Is it because it has an MRP, that protein express? Maybe. And I think that as we learn more about these, these proteins in the human side, and more studies are done looking at that in the, in the feline and canine side, it certainly may explain some of those things and, and maybe give us a better idea of how to counter them. So a quick side note, obviously p glycoprotein mutation resistance is an increased number of pumps. So what happens if you have a, redu a reduced number of pumps normally or intrinsically? 
Well, that is something that you guys do see all the time. So many herding breed dogs have a genetic predisposition to adverse drug reactions like a collie and you give him ivermectin. Over a dozen different drugs can cause these reactions and, and we've obviously discovered that the reason for it is P-glycoprotein pumps. So these dogs have a mutation in that MDR gene that we, that we talked about where they have reduced number of those P-glycoprotein pumps. That mutation leads to those affected dogs reduced number of pumps so when you give them chemo or not chemo, anything really, it builds up in their cell excessively. When drug companies make drugs, or we're doing research and we're trying to develop a drug dose, we usually use a healthy beagle model. And these healthy beagles have the appropriate number of p glycoprotein pumps. So when we calculate the dose and say, okay, the dose of that is blank, that's based on that healthy beagle with the right number of pumps. Now, if we take that drug dose and put it in one of these guys with a mutation, then instead of having 10 of these pumps on his cell, he has one of these pumps on his cell. He's going to have an increased number of drug hanging out within his cell instead of being pumped out and going to get an overdose. You're going to get a toxicity. So here are the breeds that are affected. This is not all of them, but it's a lot of them. Um, and the frequency in which they are effective. Obviously, Australian Shepherd and, uh, and Collies are at the top. I always want to say Border Collies are going to be affected, but it's less than 5% of the time actually they are actually affected. So if you ever see a, a long-haired Whippet or a McNabb, I, was, I didn't want to say that because I was like, I don't know if I've ever seen a long-haired Whippet. And somebody's going to be like, i got three of them. Um, but no, it, it, you know, those dogs, this is a cool list because it's something I refer to every now and then when if I see something unusual to say, now that guy's not on the list of multi-drug resistance, is he? But this list is interesting and, and it kind of gives you an idea of what dogs to look out for and how often they would be expressing that uh, mutation. And here are some of the drugs that can be on that problem list. And it's everything from ACE to Imodium to Doxycycline to Dancitron and then all those chemo drugs. These are drugs that are substrates of the P-glycoprotein pump, will accumulate in those cells, and will cause a toxicity to dogs with that mutation. <clears throat> we, talked about, we talked about reduced drug uptake. We talked a whole lot about increased drug efflux. And I was going to mention the next thing is... Um, alteration of some of these target proteins that drugs actually bind to and how that relates to resistance. So when you have a, uh, when you have a drug that goes in the body, it enters the cell, it's got to bind to a target um, to have its effects. And so you can actually have three different ways that these targets can be affected uh, and result in drug resistance. The first way is simply you have a decreased amount of those targets available for the drugs to bind to. They go into the cell and there's not any targets there. The next way is you can actually have an increase in targets. And that happens in the way where you have a lot of targets available in the cells and so all the chemo gets bound up in one or two cells and not distributed evenly among all the cells of that tumor. And the final one and probably the most important one is, is targets can lose their affinity for drugs. When we design drugs, we dr design drugs to target these or to hit these targets specifically in their typical normal state. So if those targets alter themselves just a little bit, well then the drugs aren't going to be able to bind to them. And all of those mutations will eventually render the drugs less effective. Now one big reason to bring this up is because of some of the new chemotherapy agents that are out there. And I would assume that at some point now, by, by now or in the next year, you're going to hear a talk or someone give a talk on Palladia tocirinib or kinovet, mesitinib, and these are a new class of drugs that are out in the, in the oncology world called tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Now, the way tyrosine kinase inhibitors are, work is pretty straightforward. It's a different way than we've ever kind of utilized before. Instead of actually killing the cell, it's just trying to render the cell less effective. Um, if you look at a cell, cancer cell or normal cell, it has these receptors, these tyrosine kinase receptors, internally and externally, and their job is to bind growth factors. So normally you have this little receptor sitting on your cell. This growth factor comes in, it binds to that receptor, and then that signals that cell to go ahead and, and undergo reproduction, continue reproducing, or helps promote excessive reproduction. With Palladia and Kinovet, the way these drugs were made is they were made to just mimic these growth factors, come in, set in those receptors, and prevent then your normal growth factors the ability to bind. If they can't bind, the cells can't be as productive, they can't reproduce, they sit there stagnant for a few months and eventually die off from just disuse. That was kind of the idea when they started creating these drugs, these tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So obviously, these drugs have to be able to bind those targets to have any effect at all. If you have a point mutation in one of those receptors, some of those targets, 
And those drugs are going to enter the body, they're going to make it down there, and the receptor is going to be like this instead of like this, and it's just going to, well, I can't, I can't bind to it. So Palladia doesn't work. The reason this is real important because this is not a concentration-dependent mechanism resistant, meaning you're not going to have Palladia lose its effects and be like, well, it's not working, I'll just give him some more Palladia, and hopefully at the higher dose it will have an effect. It's not how it works. It's not how the drug works. That's not how its mechanism of resistance work. So when you have a dog with a mast cell tumor on Palladia, it stops responding to Palladia. You can't just give it more Palladia and have any effects. You have to switch to something that hits a different target because at this point, that target is not going to, it's, it's altered in a way where it's not going to bind these normal tyrosine kinase inhibitors. It's real important. You wouldn't believe how many even oncologists I see who say, well, maybe I'll just give it some more palladium and I'll get a better response. It doesn't work that way. You've got to actually make a change. So knowing when to make a change is a big thing when you're looking at these drugs. The next thing is increased drug inactivation. In our body, we have some, some normal uh, detoxifying pathways, sulfhydryls, glutathione, GSH. These are, these are basically pathways that seek out in our body unfamiliar substances, toxic substances, chemicals, drugs that aren't supposed to be there and remove them. The idea is, again, the body's supposed to be self-sufficient. It's supposed to take care of itself. It's not, it's not made in, with in mind that, that a, uh, a doctor is going to come along and give him a drug. It's made basically to take care of itself. So when you give them drugs and they're floating through, they're going to get recognized by these de detoxification pathways and they're going to be removed from the system. Now, sulfhydryls and GSH and glutathione, they're a really strong protective mechanism and they can bind the drug uh, up in its single state, preventing any damage from that drug. Or they can also bind up oxygen-free radicals. Some chemo drugs and, and certainly radiation produces these oxygen-free radicals. And, the, and what these things do is they, they go into a tumor and instead of just having you know, one drug hitting a cell, they make these free radicals and they can bounce off and hit lots of cancer cells and cause a lot of damage. And radiation and, and some chemo agents all work in that way. So these protective mechanisms binding up oxygen-free radicals, binding up the drug directly, is going to basically reduce the effectiveness of the drugs or the radiation you're doing. So this is a mechanism of resistance again for radiation therapy as well as a lot of the very common drugs we use. The drugs like doxorubicin, and Vink, Memblastine, Cytoxin, Lomustine, Lucaran, all of those drugs that you use very commonly to treat common diseases can be affected by this inactivation mechanism of resistance. The hard thing is, is that this right here, this is a very, very, very difficult mechanism to counter because if you do go in and you say, hey, I'm just going to block all that glutathione, I'm going to block all of these protective mechanisms, then all of your normal cells are also going to get hit by these drugs in more severity and you're going to have more toxicity. So it's a tough one because you do need those mechanisms to protect your normal cells. There are some drugs that are being made out there and there are some drugs right now that we can use um, to avoid some of these detoxification pathways and they're actually called stealth drugs. So just like a stealth bomber, they're going to fly through the system, fly through the body, undetected, avoiding these detoxification pathways. You're going to see increased plasma circulation. You're going to see increased effect to the cells. One of those drugs is doxyl. And doxyl is a pegylated um, form of doxorubicin. And stealth drugs can be encapsulated in, in lipid, and so it floats through the body and they don't really recognize that there's drug in the center of that lipid. Or it can be pegylated where it's attached to a, another protein, so it moves through the body and it, and it, it avoid, basically avoids detection. Well, doxyl has directly shown to have an increased plasma circulation when compared to the same dose of doxorubicin. And it's, in, it's also shown to have a uh, decrease in inactivation when uh, compared to doxorubicin. Unfortunately, we don't use a ton of doxyl because it also has an increased uh, um, incident of adverse effects because, again, it's avoiding some of these, these mechanisms of resistance, these detoxification pathways. So doxyl is an option. I have used doxyl. I think it's a, a good drug, but you've got to be smart when you use it. You've got to know that it's going to have a higher toxicity profile, but you can get some increased plasma circulation and hit a tumor a little harder if you need to. Um, and there are some veterinary papers out there if you look up on doxyl of, of the use of it and how it compares to things like doxorubicin for tumors like hemangiosarc. And fortunately, it was very similar. There wasn't, I'll kind of spoil it for you, there was pretty similar overall survival times and results. So you have, obviously, the drug that gets in the cell, doesn't get pumped out, it hits its target, doesn't get detoxified going through the system, 
and it causes some DNA damage. Now normally cancer cells ultimately will just die of DNA damage. Um, that's how they're killing these cells. If the, if the cell starts to recognize a lot of this damage is going on, it can start to ramp up its ability to repair this damage. And so if that damage is repaired, no matter how much chemo you're getting in the cells, no matter how many mechanisms of resistance you're, you're you know, avoiding, if the damage is getting repaired and the cells aren't dying, then it's all for nothing. So when we look at some of the key drugs affected by this, carbo and cisplatin, the platinum agents are, are a big one, um, and then also these lamustine, leucarine, and cytoxin. They hit a lot of our list tonight, obviously. Platinum agents are commonly used by us. We use a lot of them. We use them for, for osteosarcoma. Dogs significantly benefit um, when they receive osteosarc or with osteosarcoma when they receive carboplatin after an amputation or a limb spare procedure. Um, you're definitely going to see it for some of the carcinomas that we treat in dogs and cats. In people, though, they use it even more. They're going to use it for breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, a lot of very, very common tumors that inflict um, men and women across the country. Because of that, they really are trying to make carbo as effective as possible. And all these, pla uh, these platinum agents are very, very effective. The way platinum agents work, the way carboplatin works, is it comes in and it causes alkylation or adds an alkyl base to one of your DNA bases, guanine. Eventually, that alkylation will break that strand of DNA and cause that DNA then to be damaged and the cell eventually die off. Now, inherently in our body, we have a repair mechanism that will repair this damage that carbo causes. It's called MGMT, O6-methylguanine methyltransferase. Now, what MGMT does is the carbo comes in, it adds this alkylation to the DNA base guanine to break the DNA, but MGMT comes in and just says, hmm, and he just transfers that alkylation off of the DNA onto itself and repairs that, that DNA. So all the carbo in the world, if it's getting repaired by MGMT, is not going to cause the death of that cell. So the guys on the human side said, well, we know we're causing some damage, but this damn MGMT is repairing it. What do we do? So what they did was they made a non-toxic competitive inhibitor called O6-benzylguanine that goes in and competitively inhibits MGMT. It basically keeps MGMT busy, so when you give carboplatin, the carbo can go in, cause its damage, and that damage not be repaired. Now, it's not a factor of does benzylguanine work. It really works. And you'll see patients in the human side who get a platinum agent and O6 benzylguanine have a markedly increased response, longer survival time, being treated very effectively with their treatment now, and not having the same effect when you take that same cancer and you treat it with just platinum agents alone. This one is one to remember. This one is going to make its way into our world. Um, O6 benzylguanine is, is definitely being looked at on the veterinary side. If we can start to use that with our carboplatin and see an even larger response rate, we may start to see some, some dogs really benefit from it and our, and our control rate for some of these tumors go dramatically up. So this is one of those that, that's, that's kind of a one that we really hope we see in our world one day. So you cause this DNA damage, it gets, avoids the MGMT repair, um, and now that cell gets programmed for apoptosis, scheduled to die, scheduled for this programmed cell death. Well, apoptosis occurs through this pathway right here, cytochrome C, APIF1, caspase 9 pathway. There are two big players in that pathway that you should know about. One's called the BCL2 gene, which is an anti-apoptotic gene. If you have a lot of BCL2 floating around, it's going to reduce the apoptosis that's going on in the body. It's been found to be upregulated in canine B-cell lymphoma. We see canine B-cell lymphoma when tested for um, uh, BCL2 have a very high increase over normal lymphocytes and, and normal cells in the body. So it is one right now that's being studied in veterinary medicine. Um, they're trying to make an antibody that'll go in and block this BCL2 gene. Therefore, you're not getting inhibition of apoptosis and hopefully improve the number of lymphoma cells that are dying with treatment. And then finally, this P53 guy. So P53 is the one that everybody has heard of. They, not, they may not really know what it does. They may not really know where it comes from, but they've heard those, those three, that letter and those two numbers put together before. So, P53 gene is a gene in our body um, that is a pro-apoptotic gene. It actually causes your cells to die. So if you have a lot of P53, you're going to have a lot of cells dying off. If you don't have a lot of P53, they're not going to die off. So P53 
It's actually kind of a good thing to have if you have cancer because it's causing your cells to go ahead and die off. Unfortunately, it's been found to be downregulated, not, honestly, this is wrong, not even in the majority of human and veterinary cancers, but actually in almost every human and veterinary cancer. We've seen some downregulation of P53 when we start treating them. The reason we see downregulation of P53 really is because it's a survival mechanism. P53 predominantly gets downregulated um, when you have reduction in your oxygen. So if you have a downregulation in oxygen, you become an, you're in a hypoxic environment, P53 will start to be suppressed because your body doesn't want all your cells to start apoptosing and dying off. Um, they actually test this in some, in some climates when you're climbing in altitude and you can have changes in P53 because your body's actually suppressing it so all your cells don't start saying, oh, I don't have oxygen and poof, you know, start dying off. But in tumors, these tumors grow large, they grow fast, and because they're growing fast, they have a reduced vascular supply. So there's a lot of hypoxic areas within tumors. And when they have that hypoxic areas, that's why this P53, when I said it's been downregulated in the major not just the majority, most every type of cancer, because at some point in some cancer, it's had a reduced blood supply. Remember, these things are just piling up on top of each other. All these cells are just dividing, 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 piling up. And they're not able to always get blood vessels to every aspect of that tumor, to all those different areas. And if you're not, there's going to be some hypoxia happening. So you get a decrease in P53, you get a decrease in apoptosis, and regardless of what your chemo is doing, how much damage you're causing, you're not getting those cells to die off like they should. So oxygenation can both hurt us and it can help us. So it can help us because, the simple fact, um, that it keeps our P53 up. But it can hurt us because if your tumor's got a lot of oxygen, it also is happening, it's growing a lot. So you've got to try to figure out how can we counter this? How can we counter hypoxia and this whole P53 down regulation? You just said that all of these tumors, almost every tumor has it, so, so how do we get around it? Well, there's a couple ways to get around it. One is just to try to learn, okay, it can't all be bad. What's working in my favor in this situation? Well, one thing that's working in your favor is hypoxic tumors can be resistant, but they also have a very slow growth rate. Usually when tumors don't have a good oxygen supply, don't have a good blood supply, they're just not going to be growing real fast. They're going to be growing fairly slow. The other thing is, is hypoxia increases acidity. And so in an acidic environment, weak acid drugs actually will have an improved penetration into the cell. So drugs like cytoxin, leucoran, lomustine, some of those drugs will definitely have a better penetration in these hypoxic environments than they will even in oxygenated environments. So you start to take this information and say, okay, it's growing pretty slow, it's not growing real fast, and these drugs may have an improved, improved penetration. What can I do with that? Well, the idea of metronomic chemotherapy came out years ago, um, and it's really caught on in the last few years for, for different tumor types. It's basically the idea that instead of me taking this tumor that's growing slow and give it a big dose of chemo and hoping what cells that are actually turning over will take it up and then we just urinate out the rest of it, maybe if I give smaller doses but give it very frequently, instead of giving it every two to three weeks, I'm going to give it every day or two, small amounts every day or two, and you're probably going to have some drug there so when each one of those cells decides to finally reproduce because it's growing slow, there's going to be some chemo there for it to absorb. And if we use these drugs like cytoxin, leucoran, lomustine, some of these, some of these chronic alkylating drugs, a lot of times they will have improved penetration in those areas of hypoxia and they'll be able to get in there even better than some of our other drugs. So metronomic chemotherapy is a good option, in my opinion, for some of these large, slow-growing tumors. It's not going to make them go away. It's not going to cure the tumor. You're going to use it in a situation where you're not going to be able to send it to a surgery service, have them remove that big tumor. You're going to use it in a situation where you're trying to slow that thing down, make some effects, and palliate that tumor. But it will work and it will help them. So the last one is this new category, these epigenetic and transient influences. So I want to just talk about these because they are something that's, that's somewhat new and because there's some, some cool stuff happening with them. So you ask yourself this question here at the bottom. Why can a dog that relapses after receiving, we'll say, vincristine, go into remission and then respond to that same drug when it comes out of remission. Like, why would you be able to give it, give it that drug, kill off all the cells that you would feel would be susceptible to vincristine, and then down the road when it comes back, you give it vincristine again and it responds. I mean, those cells obviously had to survive vincristine the first time around. Well, it's because of these transient influences. 
There are three big ones. The first one is the vascular supply, which we talked about. Now you may be able to get drug to cells that you couldn't get to before because there wasn't a blood supply going to those cells. Those cells were always susceptible with vinc. You just weren't able to get the vinc to them. Maybe it's hypoxia. Now that that blood supply is there, there's oxygen, P53 is up. These cells now have the ability to undergo apoptosis and you see a response. Or maybe it's this guy, cell adhesion. Cancer cells are never stronger than when they're together in a tumor. When they have that cell-to-cell -cell contact on all sides, when they're attached to the basic membrane, when they're reaching out and touching each other, as a mass, as a team, they're stronger than they ever could be alone. So when we look at these tumors, you see that if I can go in and get rid of the bulk of that cancer. I'm not just reducing the numbers I'm working with. If I send it to Dr. Strupp or Dr. Roach or, or Dr. Calfee and I say, hey, you know, take the bulk of this tumor off for me. It may not be just because I'm making that dog feel better by removing the bulk of that tumor. It may not be that I'm just reducing it so I have less to work with number-wise. It may be that I'm going in there and I'm breaking some of these cell-to-cell -cell adhesions down and that surgery is actually going to complement and make my chemo more susceptible and more effective, or the cells more susceptible and my chemo more effective. Cell-to-cell -cell adhesions, breaking those down, getting a smaller population to work with, not only lowers the number, but it can also make some of these transient resistance from cell-to-cell -cell contact go away, so now these drugs are more susceptible, or these cancer cells are more susceptible to the drugs we have. The next thing is these epigenetic influences, and I'm not going to lie to you, this is somewhat of a complicated um, mechanism of resistance, but it's certainly something I'd like you to, to at least have heard at some point. Again, these are influences that don't affect the DNA directly. They affect some of the support proteins around that DNA, which then affects the DNA when it's trying to be transcribed. So the first thing is this DNA methylation. It's pretty straightforward. Basically, it's where these methyl groups are getting added to some of the genes. They just make them real heavy, and you're not able to undergo transcription. If you're not under, able to go, undergo transcription, the cells are not able to divide. And if they're not dividing, they're just sitting there in a latent phase. Our drugs can't get into the cells. The next thing is histone deacetylation. And histone deacetylation, the best way I can describe it to you, um, is an analogy. I think about histone deacetylation like your water hose in your yard. You wind it up on that little reel inside that box. It sits over in the corner, nice and neat in your backyard. But when you need to use it, you have to roll it out, stretch it out on the ground. Well, DNA is just like your water hose. You can wind it up on a reel when you're not using it. It stays packaged real nice and neat in the corner of the cell. But if you're going to transcribe it, if you're going to use that DNA, you have to unroll it off that reel, stretch it out, and then you can transcribe it and the cell can reproduce and, and divide. Histones are basically little balls that the DNA winds around real tightly. They stay coiled up. For that DNA to uncoil, these histones have to stay acetylated. They have to have this acetyl group on them. If they have that group, whenever they want to, they can unroll that DNA, it can divide, the cell can reproduce, and our drug can then go into that actively reproducing cell. But if something comes in here and deacetylates that histone, knocks that acetyl group off, well then the DNA, for whatever reason, gets locked. It cannot unroll anymore off of that reel, and so no division can happen, and the cells sit there in a latent phase. So what that looks like is something like this. There's a little pink ball, and there's your DNA wrapped around it real tight. As long as these acetyl groups are on it, it can unroll whenever it wants. But if something knocks that acetyl group off, again, it can't unroll, it can't divide, our drug can't get in. So why is that important? Well, these epigenetic influences obviously prevent that cell from reproducing. And one of those very first slides I talked about was if a cell is not dividing, it's in a latent phase, or it doesn't have a blood supply, it doesn't matter. You cannot get the drug in, it's not going to work. So we saw in human leukemia and lymphoma patients that were being treated with these, D, these histone deacetylase inhibitors. These are drugs that basically prevent those acetyl groups from being knocked off the histone. The cells then can divide, stay reproducing, our drugs can get in there. They had a markedly increased response to the normal chemo drugs we use every day. This is super cool, guys. So Varenostat, or the trade name is Zolinaza or Saha, has been around for a little while, but it's being used in human leukemia and lymphoma patients, and it's dramatically making the drugs that we used yesterday, years ago, more effective because it's keeping these cells, these cancer cells, dividing. It's keeping those, those, that DNA being able to be stretched out, those cells to reproduce, and it's allowing our drugs to get in there and work better. We have fewer of can these cancer cells sitting in a latent, latent phase and not being able to absorb our drugs.
We are actively using these drugs in dogs with lymphoma. There are several studies going on right now across the country looking at Varenostat and Saha um, and other HDIs uh, to, to try to improve the drugs that we already have for lymphoma, trying to make these dogs with lymphoma more susceptible to what we have. And it is showing some promise. So what this may be, and the reason we're so excited about it, not only because lymphoma is one of the more common diseases we treat in dogs, but it's because we've been deadlocked for several years at this one year to one and a half year survival time in these dogs. We tried different combinations, different drugs, different frequencies, and we're still one year, one year, one and a half year, one year. These drugs, may, uh, these drugs here may make the drugs that we've been using for years more effective and we see a big difference in how these dogs go on and do. And I think you will start to see these drugs in our, in our world pretty quick. So we've talked about a lot of things, reduced uptake, efflux, target proteins, inactivation, repair, apoptosis, and then some of these epigenetic and transient influences. So how do you overcome it? I mean, it, it, obviously there's a lot. Well, use combinations of drugs that are not subject, subject to the same mechanism of resistance. You don't want to make a, a treatment protocol that's got with, of drugs with all the exact same mechanism of resistance because when that mechanism hits, they're all going to be uh, blocked. Use high concentrations of drugs to maximize the tumor cell kill and prevent easy efflux. When I say high concentrations, I mean basically the appropriate concentration. Not too high to make them sick, really want a great quality of life, but we've got to stay effective. We've got to push it. And, with, and honestly, with some of the stuff we have now, like serenia, um, mirtazapine, a lot of the anti-diarrheas, anti-medics, anti-nausea drugs, we can do a lot more than we, we used to, and, and these dogs can definitely receive these drugs with very, very few side effects now. Continue to develop new drugs that are not sub subject to the known mechanisms of resistance. I just told you a bunch of known mechanisms of resistance tonight. When we develop these drugs, we have to take those in mind and say, okay, we've got to do everything we can to avoid everything on that list. And there's probably other mechanisms out there we've not even tapped into yet, but at least we know we're heading in the right direction. We're not trying to go backwards. Use chemosensitizing agents. That varinostat, salinaza, or saha that we were just talking about, blocking those mechanisms of resistance may make drugs that we've been using for years way more effective, and that may be the key to really helping some of these patients live a lot longer. You've got to understand the drugs you're using and, and really the mechanisms of drug resistance because you've got to make sure you're using the right drugs at the right time and avoiding some of these overlapping mechanisms of resistance. You've got to avoid that link from diagnosis to treatment or from time of relapse to treatment. Remember Goldie Coleman, they said that the bigger the tumor is, the more resistant cells that are in it. And that's a very, very real thing. So the bigger these tumors are and the longer they're hanging out there, the harder it's going to be for us to treat these guys. Little things. You've heard that no prednisone thing for years, and it's real. I mean, it really is. You, you don't want to be on that drug and then lose all the effects of doxorubicin, which could have really made a difference. And do not underdose. Again, we're kind of going back to what I said, improper scheduling of drugs. I see it a lot, and, and, and dose intensity is a big deal. So I kind of stuck a couple slides about d uh, drug intensity in there just because I, I want to kind of hammer it home a little bit, I guess. Drug intensity is the level of cell exposure to a drug concentration over time. It's how much drug you're getting into a cell over a certain period of time. If you reduce the dose or you reduce how frequent you're giving it, you're getting less drug over time. If you reduce that intensity, you're going to increase the ability for those cells to survive. So how important is that though, really? Let's take an example here. You've got a male golden retriever weighs about 70 pounds. That's, a rough, that's roughly about one meter squared. He has, one, he has hemangiosarcoma um, and we're going to treat him with doxorubicin Q3 weeks. But his mom is super stressed out. She's super nervous he's going to get sick when we give him this drug. She heard about chemo and it's going to make all his hair fall out. She's really, really nervous. So we think, okay, it's okay. We'll take it easy this first time around. We're going to reduce his dose down just the first time. We're going to give him 25 mg per meter squared instead of our typical 30 mg per meter squared that we would use in this dog. So he's only going to get 5 milligrams less, 25 milligrams instead of 30 milligrams. So what's that really mean? A dose reduction of about 15 to 20 percent, so that 25 instead of 30, actually reduces the efficacy of treatment in the majority of cancers we treat with chemotherapy by 50 percent. That means his treatment was half as effective as it could have been. All, he, all you did was take away 5 milligrams. 
That's how important intensity is. That's how important drugs is. The reason it's important is because that's what we're working in. We're working in this exponential, rapidly dividing phase of the growth cycle of cancer. So when you pull that out and you put it over here, there's, they make these charts for just about every drug that's out there. So this would be the dose of drug, doxorubicin in this case, versus the number of cells that you can kill. When you go up from 30, you see how high up it is. But because of the steepness of that curve, backing up just a little bit, drops you down way here on the actual number that you'll kill. Intensity is a big thing and it's because we're in that phase of the whole cancer process. So with all these resistance mechanisms guys and all the tasks, seems, the task of overcoming it seems just honestly insurmountable. But it's not. I guarantee it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. We're getting better every single day. Every time we see a dog, every year that goes by, I swear, I, I get frustrated because I'm like, man, I wish we had something better. But then I look back, how sh just, just the short time period that I've been treating these guys over the, you know, the last seven or eight years, we've seen things like the melanoma vaccine, palladia, Kinovet, I mean, big time improvements in anti-medics, anti-nausea that's allowing us to give bigger doses. We're getting there. We're, eight, we're going to be able to overcome some of these mechanisms of resistance. So understanding tumor location and, and what you're starting with. I mean, is this a small intestinal lymphoma that's already starting out with a lot of p protein pumps? It's going to help you design a better protocol. Understanding the possible acquired types of resistance you can develop. Those are going to be important too because you've got to be prepared for what you may be encountered with as the, as the tumor goes on. Drug selection is key. Knowing these things and knowing what mechanisms of resistance that, that these drugs are susceptible to is going to help you pick the right drug. Dose intensity. You've got to give the right dose at the right frequency. That's going to be very important because you saw how much 5 milligrams did to that one dog. Know when to make drug changes with palladia. Don't give more drug. I mean, if, it's not, if, if that mechanism has kicked in, that drug is done. We've got to go to a totally different targeting drug. And rescue dogs with drugs that avoid all the established resistance you know about. We can do it. Resistance is something that, that we're getting better at every day. And honestly, I said to somebody else, because if we didn't think we could do it, I'd still be treating cows. I mean, honestly. I think that it's, I think it can happen. I think we're going to improve how we're, what we're doing with dogs. And eventually that's all going to go over onto the human side and help humanity in general. So. I want to thank you guys very, very much for coming out tonight. It was a great turnout, and, and I really appreciate all the support. I really appreciate the warm welcome you've given Heather and I to, to Nashville, and, and I really hope to work with, with all of you guys in the future. So, so thanks a lot. I appreciate it.